All right, chapter three, ICD-10 CM basics. So one of the things that we did um, last week initially were was that we went over the um, the book and tapping your book, the layout of the book. So you saw um, that there's an ICD-10 CM code book layout where you have your um, guidelines, your anatomical structures, your um, index to diseases, your um, neoplasm table, table of drugs, external causes, etc. So you kind of saw the layout of the book. Um, conventions and guidelines, we didn't really get a chance to deep dive into, and we will do more of that tonight. Locating the ICD-10 CM code, you've probably had some experience with that in doing your homework, um, but we are also going to walk through some examples. And then the practical application. So your practical application, this this chapter is um, probably going. You're going to feel like it's a little challenging because um, remember the practical application is not multiple choice. So you you know you will kind of have to just rely on what you see in the code book. Now you'll be able to see um, once you plug in your answers into Canvas, you'll be able to see um, whether you got. Again, if you identically in, input your answer as it is on the answer key, um, you'll be able to see you know, whether or not you got it correct and the rationale, but also remember that I do have to manually grade the practical applications um, more so now you know, than even before because your codes may not all be in the order or you may have a comma or a period that's different than what's on the answer key. Um, so let's start spend some time looking at the structure of the ICD-10 CM code book, which we've already done because we tabbed the book. So I'm going to bypass this slide, um, but just uh, remember that the most important part of diagnosis coding is always going to be referencing the guidelines. There's some guidelines that are um, very vivid and explicit in how you should, in, in what code to report and in how to list the code. And everybody can hear me, right? Yes. Okay. Okay. So your guidelines um, is always going to be your primary place of reference um, once you're in the exam environment. Now, of course, now we're in a classroom environment. We do have Google, YouTube, and other references that you can use, but everything that you're going to need to know is essentially going to be in the guidelines. But um, remember, this is concept and not uh, memorization. So we're going to learn the concepts of how to use the books and not learn the concept of trying to memorize all of the codes. Um, so in this example, how you would utilize the index to diseases, which uh, we walked through this um, and just seeing the illustration here, the index in diseases uses an indented format. So it... <coughs> Excuse me. So you're going to have your main term of history as you have here. Um, and your main terms are going to be listed in uh, in the alphabetical index in bold lettering um, with the subterms that are indented. So while your main term here is history, you have a subterm of family history. Um, I'm sorry. You have a subterm of personal history of an illness. So like if a patient has uh, let's say a personal history of allergies or um, asthma or cardiac arrest. Um, this is where you go to code that. So notice that all of those codes um, start with the letter Z as in zebra. And um, another area where those diagnosis codes are used is social determinants. So like when you go to the doctor, you know how they'll ask you those questions uh, do you feel safe at home? Are you abused? Um, do you have enough money to take care of your medical expenses? Like those are common questions that they ask now because they're social determinants. So they want to make note on your medical record of the fact that, you know, you may be abused or you may not have the money to um, maintain your medical care. Or you could be a patient that is non-compliant with their, <laughs> with their medications. Uh, like me. So, you, you know, with my asthma inhaler, I have one that I'm supposed to take every day um, as a maintenance 
um, inhaler just equivalent to like how you're supposed to take your blood pressure medications every day, but I don't. Um, so that would make me a non-compliant patient. Um, but in other many other instances, these history codes are used um, in the same fashion. They are status codes, so they just provide a status of the patient's health care on their um, medical record or in their medical record. <clears throat> Any questions on the layout of um, the alphabetic index as far as recognizing your main terms, your indented terms, um, or further in dinner terms. Any questions there? And everybody was able to see like when you're in the alphabetic index that um, the indentions are yellow, like there's that faint yellow line to show you where the indentions are. Okay. Yep. Cool beans. Um, so this is a, an additional slide that shows you that there could be multiple indentions. So like for here, um, you have a patient that has a personal history of abuse, but you still have to further break that down to identify whether the patient is an adult, whether they're a child, and then also whether that abuse took place during adulthood or childhood. So here, if you look at personal history of uh, abuse, and you have the diagnosis code Z91.419, and, and that's it for that description. That's a default code. That means this is all the information I have. Um, the doctor did not say what type of abuse it was. He didn't say it was uh, physical, sexual, psychological. All he said was abuse. So the only, and we have to report a code for it if it's mentioned in the note. So the only thing that we have to go by as far as their documentation is concerned is, um, unspecified abuse. So remember when you were looking at the coding guidelines and conventions and you saw the convention for um, N NOS and NEC? So NOS was not otherwise specified. That would be an example of the Z7, Z91.419. All of those codes, if they're unspecified, um, NOS, not otherwise, is going to end with a nine at the end of the code. Um, the ones that are in EC, not elsewhere classified, would be an example where, uh, let's say the doctor specified that it was a, a, documented that it was a specific type of abuse, but it wasn't any of these listed. Like say if it was uh, anything besides sexual, physical, or psychological. We still have to report a code, right? But in that instance, that's where we would use a code that has that NEC documented in front of it because it's documented, but it's not elsewhere classified, meaning he didn't classify the type of abuse um, in that instance. So we'll have better examples of that, but I wanted to mention that here because it's going to be important as we reference the guidelines further. So let's do a coding example. Um, looking at history. So um, the question says, looking at the alphabetic index, what is the ICD-10 CM code for personal history of alcohol dependence? So we have personal history of alcohol dependence. We, we first have to identify our main terms so that we know um, what to look up when we go to the alphabetic index. So what term do y'all think we're going to use? Are we going to use the word personal, history, alcohol, or dependence? Mm. History? History? History. Yeah, we're going to use history. So the reason why we wouldn't use alcohol is because alcohol is a, a an adjective. It's a descriptive word that is de describing the type of um, dependence or what the history is, but we're, we're focused on the main term. The main term is what we're going to use when we search in the index for our diagnosis. So go to the heading of history, which you're going to find on, give y'all a hint, 
is gonna be on page. Well, let me have y'all do this. Go to page 205, please. And if you have your highlighters, get your highlighter ready. So on page 205, notice the, the start of the history section or the history category. And that is history with the indention of family history, right? But this question is asking about personal history. So we don't want to code the family history. We want to go down to the next indention that says history personal. And that starts on page 206, near the bottom of the page in the first column. So let me know when y'all see it. Page 206, first column. And we're coding the, the um, for those who just joined, we are um, coding the example that you see on your screen. Personal history of alcohol dependence. Okay. So what did you, yeah, what did you okay. say it was uh, on page 206? Look in that first column. Yes. And, and go down to. Uh, I see it. Near the bottom of the page. Oh, I see it. Personal. Okay. Well, that's good. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so do you see an indention once you're looking at personal? Do you see um, abuse, right? But we're looking for a specific type of abuse. So okay. it's abuse of uh huh? This under substance abuse, and then go down to alcohol. So you're going to go to one sec. You're going to go to alcohol dependence. Alcohol dependence, because our main term is history. The first thing that we're code we're coding the history. Okay. The history of what? Alcohol dependence and the fact that it's a personal history. So we're currently under history personal. And if you just looked at, you have to look at your indentions. So, and remembering that they're also in alphabetical order. So under personal, it starts another listing in alphabetical order of the types of personal history that a patient can have. So it starts with abuse and then it starts with alcohol dependence because no, uh, looking at abuse, you can see that there's several indentions because there's different types of abuse, right? Mm -hmm. So after abuse, the next the next um, alcohol. listing is for alcohol dependence. After mm -hmm. alcohol is allergy. After allergy, it is anaphylactics. After anaphylactics is anaphylaxis. So that's what I want y'all to first recognize in reading the, the, the book and the table that, you know, there's a left indention um, of the page where your main term is. And then there's a second indention of the listings under your main terms. And then for each of those listings, there could be further indentions, the more detail that is pertaining to that diagnosis. So if we're looking for the answer for this particular one, personal history of alcohol dependence. If you have your answer, I want y'all to type it in the chat box for me, please. If you have your answer, type it in the chat box. Is it A, Z81.1, B, Z81.8, C, Z, 62.819, or is it D, five, uh, F, 10, dot, 21? 
Oh, okay. So when I click on that little thing that says chat, where do I type in at? Oh. Um, under the box that says you, it should be defaulted to chat with everyone. Oh, okay. There's a box right there, and when you type in that box, then it'll um, make that arrow to the right of it. Uh, it'll be hyperlinked to where you can just select it. Very good, everyone. Well, I know it's D, but I'm still having trouble trying to... Uh... Well, I'll accept that, Ma Kathy. Okay. <laughs> oh. Okay. As long as everybody got the, the same answer, and I'm happy that you all um, got the letter D. <clears throat> Any questions on being able to, to find that? Like, what were your struggles? as you were trying to determine the correct answer? Uh, to me, breaking it down to the personal history all the way to the alcohol dependency. Yes, that's uh, that was good. Okay. <clears throat> Good. So we can continue and we'll have many more examples like that as we go throughout. Um, neoplasm. So I want to go over the neoplasm table in detail. Um, turn to page 359 in your ICD-10 CM book. Okay. <coughs> what is the page? I'm sorry. 10. 359. So on page three fifty, everybody there? Sorry. Uh -huh. yes. Mm -hmm. yes. All right. On page three fifty nine, um, you have a neoplasm table. This is its own entity inside of the ICD ten CM book. No matter what you're coding, you're always going to follow the steps of starting in the alphabetic index, index to diseases. And then it will guide you to where in the neoplasm table um, you will go to determine your diagnosis codes. So the table has its own index and just, um, entries for the location of neoplasms alphabetically. And so a neoplasm can be defined as... Um, a tumor, a malignancy like cancer, uh, a primary malignancy, a secondary ma ma malignancy, a carcinoma in situ, uh, where it's, it's literally situated or um, isolated to one location, anatomic location, um, or neoplasm could be benign, of uncertain behavior, or it could be unspecified behavior. So there's times where, you know, they'll do a biopsy, they'll take a specimen, do a biopsy, send it to a pathologist to confirm a diagnosis for that specimen. And a pathologist, even after all of their, you know, testing and special tools, will still not be able to determine whether or not this is cancerous or non-cancerous. So they'll code it as unspecified. Um, that's very rare in very rare instances. Um, but this table, the way that it is laid out is um, it reads from left to right. It has six columns. So in the first column, you'll see that it is listed alphabetically by anatomic site. So it starts out with neoplasms of the abdomen and literally goes from A to Z. So you can have neoplasm of the abdomen all the way to neoplasms of the Zucker candle organ. Don't ask me what it is because I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Something located inside our body that starts with the letter Z. That's all I know. Um, 
But one of the, the main things I wanted to show y'all is just in helping you understand um, the difference between a primary, secondary, in situ, benign, uncertain, and unspecified neoplasm. So a primary neoplasm is going to be the one um, where a primary is it's the primary site of where the cancer originated. A secondary um, malignancy or neoplasm results from metastasis and it forms a new focus of malignancy elsewhere. So it could have been um, cancer that spread from the lung to the brains. That means it metastasized um, from its origination site of the lung and spread to the brain. One of the more common ones that we see is cancer that originates in the breast and spreads to the lymph nodes, as we learned about um, the lymphatic system and our immune system and how our um, defense mechanisms kick in and, and can get attacked um, easily because of the role that our lymphatic system and our lymph nodes plays. Um, where was I? So, um, yeah, cancer does typically metastasize to um, our larger main organs or the soft tissue organs, your lungs, your liver, um, brain. But it can also metastasize to any location, including the bone. Um, this is just determined by the pathologist. So that's why there's a neoplasm table. Anytime you have anything removed from your body, it always has to be sent to pathology. Whether it's a liquid specimen or a solid specimen, it is sent to a pathologist for diagnostic testing. Um, benign neoplasms are, oh, I'm sorry, let me back up. The, the carcinoma or cancer in situ is described as malignancy that's confined to the origin site, meaning it's never going to spread. Like a prime example of that is um, uh, cervical cancer, which is why we have to have pap smears, pap smears, um, you know, every one to three years, they they keep changing it. So I'll just say one to three years, um, you know, based on the AMA's recommendation, but cervical cancer is one that is more common and known to not spread to other locations or metastasize. So they call that a carcinoma in situ because it's always going to be um, situated or located in its origination site. Benign neoplasms are not cancerous. Uncertain behavior indicates that the pathologist <coughs> is unable to determine whether it is a benign or malignant. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And then unspecified means that they could not make any type of determination. So let's just explore that table for a few minutes. Um, some of the things that I really wanted to show you, and I know I told y'all to get your highlighters out for history, so we'll go back to that because I didn't tell y'all what I wanted you to highlight. But under the neoplasm table, there are a few things I do want you to highlight because this is alphabetical order as well. Every table that we come across is going to be alphabetical order. And so we start with A, abdominal. From there, it goes to abdominal pelvic, anexa, adrenal. Um, you eventually come down and it starts with the Bs in the second column. And you see back, um, Bartholin gland basal ganglia but what i want you to really focus on uh is look at bladder so just highlight the word bladder urinary bladder and the reason i'm having y'all highlight that is because there are some uh frequently coded diagnosis codes that i want you to be able to reference quickly and if you highlight it then that'll just alert you when you turn to this page that that's it, it'll draw your attention to it <clears throat> the other one, um, well, and going back to bladder, and that's because anatomically, you can have, um, anatomically, when a cancer diagnosis is given, it's given based on the, the exact site of the cancer. So it could be bladder cancer, but it could be at the uh, neck of the bladder, meaning the, the, 
the longer part of it. It could be at the orifice or the opening of the bladder. It could be at the um, sphincter of the bladder, the bladder wall. And then even when you get to bladder wall, it's um, further detailed by anterior, lateral, or posterior. So this is where the, the specifics of your diagnosis coding is going to come into play um, in understanding that we do have to code <coughs> to the highest level of specificity. <coughs> so if you look at bone on page 359, um, bone there's 206 bones in our body, right? Um, diagnosis coding, from a coding perspective, again, details are important. So if you have cancer of the bone, your diagnosis code needs to reflect which bone. <coughs> so highlight bone for me. I'm gonna make it, y'all. Okay. All right, so once you highlight bone, look at, um, <coughs> one second. All right, sorry about that. Um, yeah, once you um, look at bone, you see it starts with A for acetabulum. But bone goes all the way through the next page, page 360. And so it literally takes bone from A to B, from acetabulum bone, um, to the zygomatic. So again, um, that is why I want y'all to highlight that. Now, let's look at how to actually read the column now that we're under bone. So notice, uh, as we're on page 360, look at the under bone, look for, oh, here's a good example. Look for hand. H A N D. So if you're looking at hand. And this column reads from left to right. Let's say we have a primary malignant neoplasm or primary cancer of the hand. What do you see in that first column since we're looking for a primary malignant? C40.1. Correct, C40.1. Now, what's the dash behind the one me? Remember what the check mark meant? Well, don't you have to do whether or not it's the left or the right? That is absolutely correct, Princess. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, so you would need to go to the tabular list. To, to the where? The tabular list of your ICD-10 CM book, the back of the book. So remember, we always start either in the alphabetic index or the neoplasm table. The neoplasm table is another starting point. Um, if you already know that you have a malignant neoplasm, malignant secondary, 
or what their final diagnosis is, then you can go straight to the neoplasm table. Um, but just like last week, remember last week we did the example where it had the check mark behind the code and that meant that we had to go to the tabular list to complete the code. Same thing with that dash. So if you go to C40.1 in the tabular list, So for our example, we're going to use right hand, okay? okay. Everybody get to page um, 482 yet, where C40.1 is? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Everybody else? Yes. Cool. That's what we got so far. Um, mm -hmm. And then when you get to C40.1, what's that red circle saying next to it? The symbol of the red circle? A fifth character is required. Correct. So we oh. already know based on two things, based on the fact that we have the dash behind the first part of the diagnosis code and uh, because the symbol of the tabular list tells us we need a um, fifth character that we aren't completed with the coding of this diagnosis yet, right? Cancer, primary malignancy, cancer of the right hand. Um, so we know we need a fifth character. So once you're under C40.1 on page 482 and you look at your options, you got three options. You got C40.10, which is a malignant neoplasm of the short bones of unspecified upper limb. But we but we know it's specified, right? Because we know it's the right hand. So we're not going to use that one. Then you got a, another. You got a malignant neoplasm of the short bones of the right upper limb. That fits our description. Mm -hmm. And then you got another quote option, malignant neoplasm of short bones of the left upper limb. So because we know that we're coding the right hand, <clears throat> we need to use the, uh, which code? I'm not going to tell y'all. Y'all tell me which code to use. C40.11. <laughs> oh, right. That is correct. C40.11. So does everyone understand how we got that answer? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Everybody? Yeah, I do. Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you have to start with the the alpha, right? I mean, excuse me, the neoplasm table before you can Correct. go to the tabular table to, to know that you're right. Or Correct. Can you start with? Can you start you can, with? This you table? can you can start with the neoplasm table, or you can start with the alphabetic index to diseases. So I'll give you an example of of why you would sometimes need to start with the alphabetic index to disease is because there are um, various names for the, the term cancer. There's malignant, there's carcinoma, there's um, carcinoid, there's, um, cancer, just the word cancer. Um, so if you're not familiar with what those terms are, like if you're not familiar with um, carcinoid, carcinoma, um, to understand that carcinoma means primary malignant or carcinoid means unspecified behavior, then you, you will have to start with the alphabetic index to disease. But more times than none, um, your coding example is going to give you the hints that tell you that it's okay for you to start with the neoplasm table. And the main thing that's going to confirm whether or not you're using the right code is going to be your tabular list. Because ultimately, you have to read the code description to make sure that the description makes sense. So like in this example, um, while C40.11 didn't say cancer of the right hand, what it did say was 
malignant neoplasm of short bones of the right upper limb. But our hand has short bones mm -hmm. and it's in our right upper limb. Mm -hmm. It's a part of our right upper limb. It is our Where are you seeing the right part? Huh? Where did you see the right part? That was the example that I gave. But is in the book when I'm looking under C40.1? It is, but you have to look at the codes under it because C40.1 oh, okay. isn't a complete code because next to that, there's right. that symbol that says you need, it's requiring you to have a fifth character. Are you good on that one? Okay. All right. Well, that was that was your intro to the neoplasm table. Um, we can certainly uh, do a number of examples to walk through that, but I do want to also get to the next table, which is the table of drugs and chemicals. Table of drugs and chemicals is the second table that's going to be found in your ICD-10 CM book, and it is used to identify um, substances and causes for adverse effects, like if you take a medication and um, you have a, a bad reaction to it, um, poisoning and underdosing. So poisoning could be, um, unintentional, like, oh, like I've done, I've accidentally taken, um, two muscle relaxers or two blood pressure pills or two vitamin D pills, uh, because they all look alike. So something happens, right? <laughs> Yeah. Um, but um, intentional poisoning with the intent to do self-harm would be obviously a suicide attempt and then um, poisoning by assault would be like somebody slipped you a roofie at the club mm -hmm. um, you know that would be poisoning by assault um, poisoning undetermined would be if you had um measured higher dosages of a medication and, and they don't know how it got into your system, which a lot of times happens, you know, sometimes with patients when they go to a hospital and they're unresponsive, they just know that this person was poisoned, meaning that they've had more than the um, intended amount, but they don't know the intentions. Was it unintentional, intentional for self-harm or did somebody assault them by giving them this drug? Um, so it... When working in the emergency room, like all of this, these types of details are extremely important with the coding because it can sometimes, um, your medical records can be called into court and that's your only documentation um, to show that, you know, this assault happened or this um, suicide attempt happened or whatever. So the table of drugs and chemicals is set up a lot like the neoplasm table. Um, to the left, you're going to see a listing of drugs or substances that are listed in alphabetical order. Um, oops, sorry. They're listed in alphabetical order. The table reads from left to right with the first heading of poisoning accidental, um, accidental or unintentional. Then you have the second column of poisoning intentional with self-harm, um, the third poisoning by assault, the fourth poisoning undetermined. Um, then you have adverse effects. So if you took the medication as prescribed, um, but you have a, an allergic reaction or effect um, to the meds, then that's when you would code adverse effect. And then underdosing would be... Uh, you know, we see that a lot with patients that are mm -hmm. um, patients that are diabetic, but they don't take their uh, insulin like they're supposed to, or hypertensive, and they don't take their blood pressure medication like they're supposed to. They're underdosing, and they're also non-compliant. <laughs> non-compliant there's that word again mm -hmm. um, so uh, let's just do a quick example it says using the table of drugs and chemicals which drug is listed in the table 
for a suicide attempt using absinthe. And I think that was on. No, it wasn't. Is it? Yeah, it is. So a suicide attempt using absinthe. So if we go to this table and we look at the list of substances in alphabetical order. So you see they want the ones that um, begin with a number. They have those listed first because numbers always come before letters. Anyway, um, in the alphabetic world, anyways. Um, but here you see this listing. There's absinthe, right? Mm -hmm. And we are looking for a suicide attempt using the substance of absinthe. So what code would we report? T51.0X2. That is correct. That is correct. So does everyone agree with that answer? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is there anyone that does not agree with that answer? Or understand how we came to um, that being the correct answer? Uh, I I. I, I... I highlighted the the drug, but word I'm going across to see the the code. Okay, so this particular one is a suicide attempt. So if it's a suicide attempt, that means um, it is an attempt to do self intentional self harm. That would be the okay. second column. Uh, Okay, the T five one point zero X two. Okay. Yeah, and if you want, if y'all want, where it says intentional self harm, you can just write suicide next to that, so you kind of know, um, without having to think about it, that that's what that means. Thank you. That's a good tip for me. You're welcome. What page is that? Table of Drugs and Chemicals in our book. It starts on page 371. Okay. So the ones that have the blanks under adverse effect and underdosing. It is um, so you can't have an allergic reaction to absinthe? I don't even know what absinthe is, so. <laughs> Me either. Um, okay. So, so medically, if there's not a code for it, then that means, because remember, if we go back to, I don't know if we talked about this last week, because I, I, I vaguely remember us, or remember me struggling to try to get through. But um, diagnosis coding, I, I remember telling y'all that when we code a diagnosis codes, it gets report, reported to our local Health and Human Services, DHEC, and then DHEC reports to the CDC, the Center, Center for Disease Control. The Center for Disease Control reports to the World Health Organization, but also ultimately all of those entities report back to um, the American Medical Association as well. And so they share data, they make determinations based on um, determinations of whether or not codes needed to be added, removed, based on um, that data. So if there are, like, the need for them to create new diagnosis codes, once COVID came into play, there was no diagnosis code for COVID. There's several diagnosis codes for respiratory conditions, um, but they weren't specific to COVID. So in order for them to really track COVID like they wanted to and like they needed to, they had to create specific diagnosis codes. And initially, there were two codes. One code, well, not, no, there were three. There was one code for the testing. It was a Z code and um, encounter for mm, encounter for SARS coronavirus screening. That's what it was. That's what the code description reads. And then there was another code that said um, positive uh, coronavirus and another code that said um, post-secondary condition. 
or condition post-secondary to coronavirus. Like if somebody had um, COVID and then and then from COVID they generated uh, they went into cardiac arrest or they had kidney failure or they had uh, respiratory failure and ultimately ended up you know dying. They had to have diagnosis codes to identify that this transition from just you know, a respiratory condition to ultimately other organ failure. So that's how we got that whole addition to section, uh, I'm sorry, chapter one of ICD 10 CM, which is the diagnosis code for parasitic and infectious diseases. So to answer your question, short answer <laughs> is if there is no code for that column, then that just means there's there's not one um, because there's no reported cases of that. So they did not need to create a diagnosis code. Thank you. You're welcome. Me and my uh, my roundabout long story answer. <clears throat> So let's do let's do um one more exercise of just coding a diagnosis and we'll use we'll use the um one of the examples that are that's here on the screen. So let's say a patient has um underdosing of Now, you know what? I don't want to use one that's on the screen because I want to use something that's familiar. So let's say a patient has, um, hmm. let's say a patient has an accidental, no, an adverse effect to An adverse effect to adrenal. Adrenal. Mm -hmm. So, okay. That's uh, A D R E N A L, right? A D R E N A L. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Can I give y'all a hint? The answer is going to be on page 371. 371. Adverse reaction. Adrenal? Uh huh. Okay. Okay. Would that be T thirty eight point zero X five? Um, I lost my place. Hold on. You said adverse right. effect, right? Adverse yeah. effect. Yeah. Yeah. Uh huh. Is that T thirty eight point zero X five? Yes, ma'am. That is it. <laughs> that yep. is it. So. Um, remember I talked about, I think it was last week, that some of the codes are going to have seven characters? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This particular one has six characters, but the, the more complex the diagnosis, the more characters you're going to have in your code. So uh, a lot of times with either these, um, when you have these um, poisoning or injuries, so anything you call from this table or when we get to um, like talking about fractures and stuff, poisonings or injuries, you're going to have to report additional codes that talk about or that tell the story of how the, the poisoning or the injury happened. So if a patient, again, has, um, let's say they come in on an intentional um, self-harm or suicide attempt, then the details that we're going to have to code from the documentation of the doctor in the emergency room is going to be um, where was the patient when they when they took this medication, 
Um, mm -hmm. So that would be an external cause. You know, what was the reason that this patient has poisoning? Um, we we'll want to know the who. Who of, uh, the obvious would be the who is the patient. Then you have the um, uh, is this patient a civilian or a student? Is this patient um, was the patient working at the time? Were they on their job? And that is useful for work comp inf um, information and insurance. So like if the patient had an on the job injury, um, where were they? Were they on a job site? Were they at a school? Were they in the house? Um, if the patient fell off a ladder, did they fall from a ladder? Did they fall off a ladder? Did they fall from one level to the next? Did they fall off a porch? Um, I just want to. So it's going to be a lot of details that we would be required to code um, that is referred to as external causes to injury, which brings me to the next section of um, this ICD-10 CM book. The external causes of injury index. So because it's listed as an index and not a table, it's going to look a whole lot like the alphabetic index to disease. And this is an overview. Um, okay. Once again, so if you look here. You see that um, on this slide, to the left of the slide, it tells you that the external cause codes describe how an injury occurred. Um, those codes are never primary, so they could never be your first listed diagnosis code. They're always going to come after your primary diagnosis of what the actual injury was, um, because they're, again, telling the story of how um, this person injured themselves. Hmm. Okay. okay. Um, it too is again listed in alphabetical order like the index to disease. So I love the example that um, I've used on the slide, which is fall. Because fall is going to be probably one of the more common ones, and it's relatable, um, you know, just from a teaching standpoint. Mm -hmm. um, because as I was just mentioning, somebody can fall uh, from a building, they can fall down, they can fall up the stairs. I've done that. <laughs> you can <laughs> fall into something. You could you could fall on a person. You could fall due to a person. So there's a lot of details that are going to go into that. Very descriptive. Um, the biggest thing that you need to know about these codes is that, um, and also the place of occurrence. That's a that's another part of, you know, this section. Um, how it occurred, like what was the patient doing when it occurred? Um, for example, motor vehicle accidents. If someone is in an accident, then your code is going to have to reflect. Um, where the accident occurred? Was it on a highway? Was it on an interstate? Was it a dirt road? This uh, really does paint the picture of illustration. And remember, when we code, we're coding so that um, this claim can be billed to the insurance company. So we're painting the picture for the insurance company by our diagnosis codes. Um, so let's look a little bit further into that section that section starts on page 419 and once we get through this part we'll do some diagnosis coding from your book On page 419, um, I'm sure the first thing that you saw is the letter A, <laughs> um, where, the, where the section starts. 
Um, and we all should have that page tab. Y'all got your tab at the top of the page on that one? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Good, good, good. Um, <clears throat> so if we're looking at this and your patient is, um, we'll just go easy since it's on this page, accident, was in an accident. Um, and I will, you know, go ahead and say these are challenging only because you just have to remember that everything occurred in alphabetical order. And for me, in my own eyes, my challenge in this section was just being able to focus my eyes. So that magnifying glass or, um, you know, having um, something like a ruler that's going to help you kind of keep your your eyes focused on one line is going to be very, very helpful. Um, so if we're looking at accident and I'll just say, let's go with, uh, let's go with, excuse me, middle column, the middle column where it says non- Um, let's go with, um, oh, okay. Let's go with accident on board a watercraft. <clears throat> accident on board a watercraft. Because where do we live? We live in Charleston, right? Well, except for one person. But most of us live in the Charleston area. Mm -hmm. So it would not be strange for us to be on or near a watercraft, right? Right. Like a jet ski. And um, if you look at onboard watercraft, you see a diagnosis of V93.89 with a check mark, right? Mm -hmm. Um, excuse me. All right. And so that check mark means that we're going to need an additional character. So it works the same. I just kind of wanted to show you that it works the same as if you have coded, as you have coded. Um, in other areas, the only difference here is that it's a different subsetting of codes that would come in addition to um, in addition to what you have coded for your injury. So let's just say somebody had a broken uh, that same broken hand that um, I'm sorry, we coded a cancer. But let's just say somebody had a fracture. They broke their hand, right? How did you break your hand? You were on the watercraft and your hand collided with another watercraft. So this is going to be where that start would come for your coding after you coded the diagnosis for the broken hand. Um, so I'm not going to do an example right this second because I want to make sure that we get through just some of the basics. This is something that we're going to code and work on um, next week. So this is still kind of like our overview of all of the sections that we didn't get to do last week. Okay. Um, the tabular list of diseases chapters um, is going to be a equivalent to the diagnosis code chapters. So we need to explore the coding chapters. One thing that I would like for y'all to do is, because we already talked about the tabular list, so that's like the main parts of the book. So now let's just kind of sit and talk about some of the guidelines um, that you're going to, or the overview of guidelines more so. <clears throat> First part of the guidelines, y'all, and really understanding that is going to be understanding it visually. So let's start back with page G1 at the beginning of your book.
Alright. On page G1 is the table of contents for the guidelines and the guideline pages. Now, um, everybody understands how to read this. Like if you were going to go to the specific, I'm sorry, if you were going to go to section one, in a section 1a so if you look at um, under page g1 in that first column you see at the bottom where it starts it has section one and then it has the letter a wait i'm sorry I'm, I'm lost. oh yes okay, yeah page g1 if everybody can go to page g1 the first column of page g1 so we're going to start with going through the guidelines we're doing an overview of the guidelines and the first thing we need to do is look at the table of contents. This is under the tabular list, or I thought it was. No, page G1 in the beginning of the book. We're, we're done with the tabular list for okay. right now. Okay, I'm sorry. That's okay. You probably thought that because it says the tabular list of diseases and injuries. I'm going to show you how it correlates um, in a few and it does, but I want to make sure that we spend enough time on the guidelines and the guideline over here. Okay. Um, you there? Yes, I am. Okay. Um, so the, oh, on page G1, um, just really kind of showing y'all that this is your table of contents. This is a page that you're going to go to when you don't know where to go. When you're trying to find a guideline and you don't know what page that guideline is on, it's going to save you time in the end. So if you were looking for section um, C in the guidelines. I'll use, I'll start there for an example because that's going to be the most commonly used place in the guidelines that you reference the entire time for the remainder of this course. Section C of your ICD 10 CM official coding guidelines. What page is that going to be on? And you're going to look at this page to, to tell you where to quickly go for section C. G7. That's correct. Um, does everybody see that? Yes. yes. Section C on page G7. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So do me a favor. Y'all got those highlighters that I keep telling y'all to get and not telling y'all to highlight anything? <laughs> highlight um, for me a couple of things. Okay. At the beginning of um, where it has section one in that first column, I like that because it has section one, G3. So that's telling you that section one begins on page G3. Okay. Um, I want you to highlight C, where it says C, at section C, or yeah, section C begins on page G7. <laughs> okay. And that's all I want y'all to highlight from this, on this part. Okay. Um, turn the page to page G3 where section one does begin. So the, the guideline section is broken down. It is broken down by, um, is broken down by like an outline. Like if you ever remember having to make an outline in school, mm -hmm. um, that's how it's laid out. Um, So let's see. Okay. So if you're looking at this outline, it because there were some homework examples where you probably saw where it was saying like what guideline is one dot C dot you know, two dot a dot whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to help y'all with that right now. <laughs> yeah. 
just one of my questions. <laughs> so, um, and that was in section one. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so highlighters, please highlight. There's four sections of of um, guidelines. There's four guideline sections, right? Um, section one is going to be the conventions, general coding guidelines, and chapter specific guidelines. So these are guidelines that are going to pertain in general to all ICD-10. Um, some of the guidelines that are there that we'll go more over next week are things that tell you that your code can be three, three to seven characters. Um, a guideline that tells you that the seventh character is going to be used to identify um, what, excuse me, what the seventh character is going to be used to identify. Um, there's guidelines specific to, or excuse me, conventions that reference when you see specific words like and or with in your coding. Um, there's guidelines or guidance to help with the punctuation. So those are like the general things that you'll see with all diagnosis codes. So highlight section one. And mm -hmm. if you have a different color highlighter, highlight um, capital A. So this is, this is how the outline is going to work. Highlight capital A conventions for the ICD-10 CM. Mm -hmm. So you'll know that this is section one, and under section one, this is A, capital A. And then after y'all do that, turn to page uh, G4. <clears throat> so on page G4, you have B and D in this, capital B in this outline, um, starts the list of general coding guidelines. So again, those general coding guidelines would be utilized for, for all, <clears throat> excuse me, for all, um, codes that you're going to see in this book. So some of the things that you see in general coding guidelines um, that we'll talk about next week would be um, how to handle situations where you have multiple codes, um, more than one diagnosis, um, how to handle situations when your diagnosis says that the patient has acute or an, an acute or a chronic condition, um, how to handle when your diagnosis code has, like we saw in the cancer exam example, it had the laterality included in the code, like left hand, right hand, um, left foot, right foot. So that's what these general coding guidelines are there to kind of help and coach you through um, instances of when you would use that. Alrighty. Now, highlight on page G7. Page G7. On page G7, I want y'all to highlight C. So C is chapter specific coding guidelines. And this is where our meat is going to be. Meaning, our meat meaning, um, how do I code uh, neoplasms? You know, specific to neoplasms, specific to um, certain infectious and parasitic diseases specific to, um, what is chapter three? I think chapter three is diseases of the blood. Chapter four is specific to, um, nutritional and metabolic diseases. Chapter five is 
specific to mental health. So this is where it kind of breaks down into the very specific types of conditions. And that's what we see on this slide right here. So the next thing that I do want y'all to highlight is we're going to go through each one of these um, guideline sections. And I just want you to, did I have y'all do this last week? No. Okay. So I just want y'all to highlight the header of that section. So like on page G7, and if you do have another different color highlighter, um, you can use it for this, this part as well. But if not, any highlighter is fine as long as you'll be able to quickly see it um, when you look at, that, look at that page. <clears throat> All right, so the first one on page G7 is going to be chapter one. Certain infectious and parasitic diseases. I like that. Just that. Just that. Just guideline one. Mm -hmm. And then um, <clears throat> chapter two guidelines begin on page G10. Got one and two. Chapter we'll one, go. chapter two. Yes. Uh -huh. Yes. Chapter three is on page G thirteen. <clears throat> so we see something unique with chapter three, um, in that three. it says reserve for future guideline expansion. That's on page G thirteen, um, about midway in the first column. So highlight that, and then also highlight chapter four, endocrine, nutritional, and metabolic diseases. G14, there's chapter five and chapter six. So go ahead and highlight those. So if you, if you wanna keep going, you can go ahead and highlight those, but I'll give y'all time to um, time to do that. Page G15 has chapter seven, and this goes all the way up to chapter 22. So that's why I wanted to also leave that slide up. Everybody got up to chapter seven? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Let me know when y'all get to 22. Okay, so she goes.
Excuse me for one sec. Go to the How y'all doing? Okay. I can buy the 22. Yep. 22 was it, right? Mm hmm Yes, ma'am. All right. Mm -hmm. That's everybody? I can see y'all, so I can see. Mm -hmm. I can see yeah. some people still working. I'm yeah. done. Okay, awesome. Um, Mona, you okay? Yes, I'm done. Okay. All right, so now the, the link to this in the tabular list is notice how, say, for example, after one, certain infectious and parasitic diseases, it has A00 through B99. Did everybody tap their tabular list section? Yes. Okay. Uh -huh. For neoplasms, chapter two guidelines, C00 through D49. So that's representing the diagnosis codes um, that you will find in that section. Now turn to page, um, actually, no, let me not do that yet. Um, chapter four, endocrine, nutritional, and metabolic diseases, E00 through E89. So that would be things like diabetes, um, um, hyperlipidemia, uh, low potassium, those, that would be things that you would find in that section. Um, turn to page, <clears throat> turn to page, actually, let me back it up. So turn to page G13. And hold that page down and also turn to page 527. 527. G13 is 527. Okay. Everybody got me? Everybody with me? Mm -hmm. Yes, I am. Do you know where that was? 
<laughs> Which one? Well, at the 527. I was sitting here going, was that the set of tabs that we were to do separately that I can't put my hands on? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. You were just supposed to start back over, right? Okay. Right, with the um, A00, with the rest of the tabs that you had left. Right. Okay, I understand. <laughs> but it's okay. You can do it this week. Just finding them. I've carried them around. <laughs> oh, did you? <laughs> so I'm not sure where I put them, but that's okay. I understand uh -oh. now what to do. <laughs> Thinking that was a question I had. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, all right. So um, when you look at page G13, it lists um, specific guidelines. And, I, and we'll deep dive into this next week, but just so you can see kind of how specific the guidelines are and why in what instances you would need to reference them. So, um, oh, this is kind of where I was going to. So right now we're in section one, right? Yes. We're under capital letter C, correct? Which is the section for, or capital C, which is chapter specific guidelines. We're in chapter four. So, so far, if we were to um look to see where we were located in the standpoint of an outline we are currently at section one c chapter specific guidelines and we're in chapter four so that's one dot c dot four okay so if you were looking at your homework okay um c and came across a question similar to that, like if it said it gave you the address, and that's what we call it, the address of a guideline, and asked you what guideline is located at this address, that's that's what that's where I'm headed. That would be I'm trying to see what section it was. Because that is going to make you make a world of sense out of the guidelines. That wasn't anywhere in the chapter. Oh, it was. Okay. It was. Oh, Looks like it was section. Um, section review 3.3. .3. But anyway. Um, so yes, we are at section one. C, chapter specific guidelines. And we're at chapter four. So now anything that came after that would be pertaining to a guideline in chapter four. So if you look on page G13, look at the first uh, lowercase letter A under chapter four. The heading is diabetes, diabetes mellitus, which is the true medical term for it. Um, and notice in parentheses, it says that it is uh, figure 1.c.4.lowercase a. So if your question was, what guideline, what what diagnosis is referenced in the guideline 1.c.4.lowercase a, and the answer would be diabetes. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. Yes. So if we actually look at um, A of that, A just gives kind of a, a short synopsis of um, diabetes codes. In this particular section, it tells us that diabetes codes are combination codes because um, diabetes as well as hypertension, you know, we are gateway um, conditions that typically um, cause other underlying conditions. So, you know, long-term uncontrolled diabetes can cause end-stage renal disease. It can cause... Um, stroke, it can cause heart attack. So all of those conditions, if they are coupled with or combined with diabetes, then there's going to be what they call a combination code, meaning you won't have to report multiple codes because that one code or maybe two codes would include a multitude of different diagnoses. Diagnoses, sorry. So 
so um, further looking at the guideline, because we're more so focused on the guideline address, which is that 1.c.4, etc. So let's look at um, the next one. We're under Chapter 4, Endocrine, Nutritional, and Metabolic Diseases Guidelines, which says the codes range from E00 to E89. So that's what we highlighted. Um, letter Lowercase a tells us we are under um, all of this section is related to diabetes mellitus. And then A is broken down into bullet points. So you got A.1, A.2, A.3. A.4.5, so if we were looking for guideline 1.C.4.5, when, when somebody finds that, I want you to read the entire guideline description to me. Hmm. You just put the E11 dash. No, you've got to put something else because of the dash. So I'll, I'll tell you what it is um, just because I know. So anytime, etc., etc., E11. Nine. So the diagnosis code of E11.9, y'all can write that in. Just go ahead and write in point nine. E11.9 is the default diagnosis code for type 2 diabetes um, because there's type 1 and there's type 2. So if a doctor does not document the type of diabetes that a, let's see, that a patient has, then this guideline is telling us that we can automatic... <laughs> Automatically, because I don't know how that word was about to come out. Automatically use E11.9 as a default code. So if you were coding something, right, you, you're looking at one of your test questions and you're like, oh, no, the patient has diabetes and I don't know how to code it. First place you're going to go is the guidelines. If you're unsure. The guidelines is going to instruct you on how to properly report that code. The tabular list and the alphabetic and the tabular is going to tell you what the code is, but the guidelines is going to tell you how to report it, how to apply the rules to report the code properly. That makes sense. How to record it. Tabulars, what it is. Mm-hmm. But if you know the nine, but if we needed to look up the nine, we'd find absolutely. that in the tabular. Yes, absolutely. And if you if you want to go to the tabular right now, which I think that was what page five twenty seven. Five twenty seven. Okay. So the tabular is always going to confirm. What the guidelines what the guidelines says. So E eleven point nine or E eleven you can just go to that. Without complication. And if you look at E11.9, yep, it says type 2 diabetes mellitus without complication. But also if you go back to the guideline, it says if the type of diabetes is not documented in the medical record, the default is E11.- meaning you need to go to the tabular, but it also says comma, type 2 diabetes mellitus. And when you go to the tabular, you see that E11.9 is the code for type 2 diabetes mellitus. Is that clear to everybody? And if it's not, um, 
let's make it let's make it click I'm still looking for the 11.9 in the uh, tabular list. Okay, page 537. Okay, yeah, okay. We're not supposed to understand yet all the things to the right of that then. To like, the right of the tabular? Well, it doesn't it matter. Is... So it, it, all of that is there for a purpose, but it doesn't apply to what we're doing. So these same diagnosis codes can be used for a patient that's in an outpatient. Like you're just going to your endocrinologist or your primary care doctor, or they could be used for a patient that is in the ICU um, suffering from critical organ failure due to diabetes. Um, so all of the stuff that you see over to the right is relevant, but not for not for you all as you're pre preparing for the certification exam. So okay. just ignore it. That that information is more so for inpatient status. Our focus is outpatient. So all you're focused on is what the code is and the code description. And that's going to be one of the bigger challenges with, you know, this book um, is learning how to weed out what you don't need. Yes, there is a lot of information there, but what information is going to be vital for you to ultimately determine your um, correct diagnosis? And my only advice for that is to um, learn how to have tunnel vision when when you're looking at this. Um, like, uh, we'll, we'll code another example in a little bit, and I'll kind of show you what I mean by that. Um, don't get, don't allow the words to make your decision cloudy because there's so much information. <clears throat> um, so again, if I was to, another example, give you, if I was to say, Tell me what is, tell me what guideline 1.C.4, because we're still we're just going to stay here in chapter 4, dot A dot Five dot A. All right. C dot four. C five. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, four. Nope, scratch that. I think I typed that wrong. No, I didn't. I got it. Section one. Under C, chapter specific guidelines, we're in chapter four. Mm -hmm. Under diabetes mellitus, which is the first lowercase okay. a. Mm -hmm. And then number five would be the guideline for complications due to insulin pump mal malfunction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That'd be the five A. And then the A would be under dose of insulin due to insulin pump failure. Okay. 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 Let's do one more from a different section, just so I I know, just so I'm confident that. Oh, as y'all, I feel like y'all would have chapter four down, but you know, how about? Okay. How about one? Dot C dot two. So that, that first number is always going to tell you what chapter guidelines you need to be in. So chapter two is um, that's the guideline for neoplasms coding. So two dot C dot. 
what guideline is that? 1.c.2. Dot lowercase c dot one. What what was that lowercase? Um, I got one. Um, lowercase dot c dot one. Okay. Is it anemia associated with malignancy? Yeah. Yes, anemia associated with malignancy. Hmm. Perfect. All right. Now, so that's all I'm going to do with the guidelines. We got them highlighted. Next week, we deep dive in all the way in. So I want to do some more coding examples. Um, next week, we do get into a little bit more detail with coding specifics from each chapter. Um, with multiple scenarios, but let us, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go to the practical application book. I'll give y'all a um, scenario to code, and we'll spend our last 15 minutes doing that. So give me the diagnosis code for... Um, fever. So, first place you're going to go in your uh, alphabetic index to diseases is you're going to go to fever, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, I got R five oh point nine uh, on page one seventy eight. When you're changing books, you said though. No, we're in the same book. Oh, okay. I'm I'm just pulling examples from the practical application. There's no check mark behind it. R five oh dot nine. Right. Now, would I, would I go to the tabular list to confirm it, even though there's not a check mark? Good question. I'm going to hold that thought for one second until everybody um, finds their answer. There's fever. So, what if else? you do have your answer, I know you have yours, Ma Kathy, but everybody else, can you type your answer in the chat box for me, please? I'm sorry, we're looking, we went, went to, with fever. It's just fever. That's that's the only information that you got from the doctor is that this patient has, has a fever. That's all we know. Okay. And um, let's see how we all are. I'm um, gonna spin. So, are you on page 178, Shield? I am. <laughs> I was thinking I was in the wrong spot, but I, mean, I see fever, but I don't see where y'all are getting the R509. So If we see fever, um, you see a diagnosis of R50.9. Do you see that on page one? I do, I do. Okay, but that's with chills and stuff, right? So, Say that again. It says with chills, of unknown, persistent with chills. Right. Good observation. So when you see, um, my Kathy asked the question, and her question was, do I still need to go to the tabular list? 
And then um, also we have some additional terms in parentheses after our main term. So a couple of things about that. The terms that you see in parentheses is what we call um, non-essential terms, meaning they may or may not be relevant to your coding example. So if this fever was of unknown origin, which may or may not be documented by the doctor, um, if this fever was persistent, meaning the patient has taken um, medic medication um, repeatedly and could not get the fever to break, um, or if the pa fever was with rigor, no matter what, of all three of those scenarios, your diagnosis will still be R50.9, and it's going to be R50.9 because that is the best match for your code description, your diagnosis description. Um, the doctor did not say it was a uh, Brazilian fever. He did not say it was a um, enteroviral fever. He gave zero specifics as to the type of fever that this patient has. Um, okay, so that is going to be our answer of our 50.9. And um, as far as going to the tabular list, in instances like this, my answer is no. And I'm saying no for a number of reasons. Um, number one, we know that we're looking at this code description, and it is what we call a one-to-one -one code map. That means there's only one code for an unspecified fever. And that's R50.9, and it's always going to be that. Um, so in this instance, no, you do not have to go to the tabular list because the tabular list is going to give you the same exact code because there's only one code for unspecified fever. So what that's going to do for you in an exam setting is that is going to save you time from um, having to... Go to the tabular list, read through all of those sections, because ultimately what we're trying to do is teach you how to code in your coding concepts, but also throughout the course, you're going to learn time saving tips. And that's going to be a big one right there. Okay. Okay. Um, oh. So let's do another example. Um, let's do... Uh, let's do epigastric pain. So, we have epigastric. epigastric pain. So, epigastric refers to, we know if you break that medical term down, gastric or gastro refers to the stomach. Mm -hmm. Epi is a directional term that tells you in what proximity to the stomach that that pain is located. So that's your condition, I'm sorry, that's your description of where the pain is located. So with that being said, what do you think your main term is gonna be? Pain. 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 Would it be pain? It would be pain, yes. Pain. 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 Look up pain. So, under pain, I see gastric. All right, so let me check that. Oh, there it is. Okay. All right. AIN? Mm hmm. <clears throat> now, once you're at pain, where is our pain located? 
Epi. On the scale above. Um, uh, uh, your, your code in the chat box, please. I don't know how I remembered um, that he meant above. It's this song that I recall from Sesame Street um, when I was a kid. And the song was about somebody flying airplanes, but they like reference Epi. And so I always remember every time I think about Epi, I remember that song. It was called Above It All. And it was like some Muppet. I think it was like Grover flying in an airplane. Y'all want me to sing this song for y'all? Because you know I kind of do a little bit. My memory is like so vivid when it comes to stuff like that. Above it all, I love to fly. Above it all, way in the sky. Above it all. So hard, I love above it all. <laughs> okay, I got a question. I'm trying to I'm trying to learn how to do the chat thing. Can everybody see my answer? That's all I can see. What I typed in the box. I don't no, know. Oh, okay. Yeah. So if you typed it, you still over to the mm -hmm. right, you see that little white arrow? White arrow. Actually, you can hit enter. Hit enter after you type. Oh, it. okay. Yeah. Did it go? Yes. Okay. Cool. <laughs> 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 it don't take much to make me happy. <laughs> yeah. Yes, you got it. So yeah, you learned something new tonight. Yeah. And you learned a new song. I did. Mm-hmm. You did a good job. Thank you. <laughs> well, I remember Epi. No. That's right. So y'all, that and that's that's how I remember things. So I, I think I suggested that to y'all on the first <laughs> night. Like, you know, if it's a, a song, when I used to, when I was in college, I used to study to music and I used to study to instrumentals so that I could take the words of whatever I was studying and put it into um into into the music that I was listening to. So I I could I I have rap songs that I made up for <laughs> medical terms. Okay. I'm not gonna I can't I can't show you all my talents in one night. So <laughs> I'll save the rap songs for next week. Okay. <laughs> um All right, so everybody good? Let me make sure everybody got that. Yes, does everybody understand how or why that R10.13 R is the correct answer? Mm -hmm. All right. And you, and you don't have to go to the tabular list, right? You don't. Okay, no. yeah. I'm just because there's nothing else to look for, mm -hmm. right? Right. <laughs> Ooh. Okay. So the tabular list, as well as the guidelines, is for <laughs> when you are toggling between answers in your mind and you need something to confirm for you that yes i'm on the right track yes i'm using the right codes yes i'm i have the codes in proper order because it does get more complex um especially when you start dealing with chronic conditions or strokes heart attack heart disease uh hypertension it, it definitely gets more complicated where you will need to rely on the guidelines and things but when you have moments like this where you don't have to enjoy it um we're going to do another example this one is going to be otitis media uh yeah otitis media left ear so otitis media left ear is fancy medical talk for ear infection. Talking about inflammation. So instead of you can go to inflammation. I'm so glad I heard you say that, Shields. You can go to inflammation, but I promise you, if you go to inflammation, it's going to send you on a wormhole. 
right. information, right. and then it's going to send you the ear, and then it's going to send you the middle ear, and then, yeah. So, save yourself some time and go straight to otitis, the actual medical term. Right. Oh, Titus, media left ear. Oops, I do. Oh, Titus, of inner ear. Uh, meaty. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, Titus, what? Media. <clears throat> oh, Titus. So this may be one because there's a specific amount of detail that you may want to reference the tabular list. Can you repeat it one more time? You said otitis and what else? Media. Otitis, media, left ear. Media, left ear, okay. Mm hmm Y'all feel like y'all struggled with that one? I feel like I am. I am <laughs> the left part. Like, I don't know what yeah, I'm media I've got, but not. So, so, shields, to determine your final character, go to the um, tabular list. H66. Mm -hmm. um, that. Nine. And Shaniqua, was that you? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma okay. 
So Shaniqua, what what part are you struggling with? Is it just the visual of looking at the page because it's super busy? Yes. Hmm? Okay. I might not be in the right section too. What page are you on? I'm flipping through the tabular pages. You're on page um, 277? E 277? Uh, I'm sorry. 276. 276, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I have the H66.90 part, but it's throwing me off with the left. What me? So I see media, but it's throwing me off with the left part. Like, I don't know where. Oh, okay. So you got the H66.9. <laughs> yeah, what point nine? You're in the tabular list. So when you're yes. in the tabular, I'm sorry, go to page. Um, I got my finger on it. Go to page uh, 648. 648. Mm -hmm. well, I wasn't far enough. Okay. 648. Because so far you, so if you kind of think about it like you're building a code. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and you know you have the H66.9 and you know you need more. Um, so I think again, I think you, you kind of know knew where to go. I think it was just because the page was busy. And honestly, I knew the code already. Mm -hmm. I couldn't find it on the page because it was a lot of words. Um, I don't have on my glasses and I had a hard hard time finding it. Okay. But I eventually found it. I got it now. Okay. That's wrong. So yeah, I like to be transparent with y'all, you know, about stuff like that. If like if I'm having trouble finding it, I already know you're gonna have trouble finding it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I see. That's left or right, right? Are you okay, Shields? Yes. I am from the tabular list. Okay. But um, I didn't find it on the other one, and I'm not sure why. Go back to page. Uh, 266 276 okay. so it's in the Titus and then I found media third column yep at the very top so after media there's um H66 <coughs> with the check box okay <clears throat> point nine okay mm -hmm. two Specified. Do you always see this unsupportive? Okay. Um, it might be too far. It's at the very. It's at the very top of page two seventy six in that third column. So right after it says media, it gives you the h sixty six dot nine. I and see that. Has the, has the check box behind it, so you really don't need to go any further than that. So the two is not necessary. It is, no, isn't two, it? the two is necessary, but you don't need to go any further on that page. Is what I mean, I'm saying. Just know to go. Does because the two is the two is what completes your code, um, because it tells you which ear. Mm -hmm. It identifies which ear. So here's a rule of thumb that you're gonna need to know with diagnosis and CPT coding, is that anytime you're coding in reference to a body part that comes in a natural pair um, or an anatomical pair of two, you have two, two eyes, mm -hmm. yeah, eyes, ears, um, uh, lungs, hands, lungs, breasts, kidneys, legs, feet, knees, shoulders, you know, your limbs. So anything that automatically comes in two, you're always going to have to identify either in your diagnosis or your procedure, plan, whether it was the in reference to the left or the right side or both. So that's going to be that's a convention. Um, that's going to be a rule of thumb down the line. 
So how y'all, how y'all, are y'all feeling better right at this very moment than you were at 6.30? I do. I do. Yes. I do. <laughs> um, is that the same sentiment for everyone? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Yes. I want to do one more example. This one's going to be a hard one. <laughs> Everyone has it. All right, last one. <laughs> Chronic. I'm going. To, I'm going to type it in the chat box. Everybody has access to be able to see the chat box, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, if you have your practical application book, it's number two. Okay. Um, but it is chronic non intractable in migraine headache with status migraineous. Don't kick me. So, first thing you have to do here is identify your main term. You got a couple of different words that you can select from for your main term, but one is going to get you there quicker than the other. So, the one that I am going to suggest that you start with, because you got two main terms there. One is headache. One is migraine. And then you got a lot of other descriptive words. You got chronic, you got non-intractable, you got um, common. So my recommendation is going to be to start with the medical term first. The medical term in this example is migraine. Because headache is vague, right? Migraine is more specific. It's a specific type of headache. So I would start with migraine. And I'll save you some time and tell you that it's on page. The, the, the header, the main term of migraine starts on page 257. So we got... And I'm coding it with y'all because I don't have my answer key in front of me. So the chance to be it could be two colds or um no it's gonna be one. It'll one be one okay. It's gonna... Once you do you need a migraine is a headache. So does it not do you need it to say? Yes. Because I'm saying like with status migrainus. Um so, like in other words, non intractable and status migrainus were what stuck out to me. To yeah. Do. So this is this is one of those instances where you kinda gotta <clears throat> look at every every piece of detail. So I see a few answers coming in. <clears throat> So those of you that have answers thus far, um, confirm via your tabular list. 
Because I'm looking at a few of them and. Oh, no. Three. I'll probably go on three. Very attractive. Um, I got something hmm. intractable. Chief plus three. Okay. <laughs> Not in triangle. Is it anything like that? Mm -hmm. That is my greenness. Okay. Common. Ah, uh -huh. okay, okay, okay. Everybody see where, so this was a um, chronic non-intractable common, uh, common migraine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh -huh. and then when you go to common, uh, on page 258 is where I saw the word common. So mm -hmm. let me put this back in here for you. So you can so it'll be fresh. Uh -huh. Anyway, when you go to common, uh it says cross reference, see migraine without aura. Yeah, I see it now. Yeah. And so when you go to migraine without aura. Not in track. With that is non intractable. Okay. With that is. Yeah. So um that's right, princess. Let me make sure let me see if anybody else said it. So Kathy, Ma Kathy did answer that. Mona did answer that correctly. Okay. So definitely a lot of detail in that. So I'm gonna mm -hmm. backtrack it and go through it again. So we started with a full description of chronic, non intractable, common migraine, headache. With status migraine, uh, yeah, migraineosis, and we had to decipher first what was our main term. So we determined that headache was, or could have been a main term, but it was not as specific, and it would have wormholed us into all of these words. It would have been a much longer search than what it was just now. Um, mm -hmm. So starting with migraine was the best option because it was a more detailed and specific diagnosis. And then when we went to migraine, under the heading of, uh, under the main term of migraine, we saw the word common. And common, which also describes our diagnosis, gave us a cross-reference of C migraine without aura. When you go to migraine without aura, which is about um, more than halfway down the page on page 258, G43 category. We look for without aura, chronic, because chronic was another descriptor, descriptive word of our condition that this was a chronic migraine. So under chronic, 
we then look at the indentation for not intractable or non intractable mm-hmm. with status. Migraine osis. And that gives us mm-hmm. a diagnosis of G43.701. So that everybody mm-hmm. understand how we got that. Mm-hmm. That was probably the hardest one in uh, in chapter three's practical application. So if you were able to understand that, use those same concepts that you did apply to get that answer to um, your diagnosis coding going forward. And honestly, it was all just based on kind of taking your time and reading through all of the options. So now I'll re-ask the question. Do you feel better now about diagnosis coding than you did at 630? Yes. (laughs) (laughs) All right, so I will ask y'all individually. Ma Kathy, are you okay with um do you have a good understanding, a better understanding? Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Priscilla. Yeah, I see that exactly what it says. That's what you have to look for. Exactly what it says. Yeah, and that is the absolute truth. And you know, in, in instances where you're unsure, that's when you can reference the tabular and or the guidelines. Uh, Shaniqua? Yes. <laughs> I just need to take my time. <laughs> yeah, that's that's it. And you know, like I, I said, like rush through you that have one. like your glasses, your magnifying glass, your ruler, if that's what you need, you know, to help your eyes focus. Mm-hmm. Um mm, I'm good. I'm feeling good about it. All right. Shields? I'm feeling much, much better. I'm not sure if I would have found that one in the alpha section. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah, it does. (laughs) Just I'm not. I'm still still going, okay, after this, I'll look for this, you know, like. Mm -hmm. And that's going to probably happen to you for the the remainder or going into the next few weeks because it's still very new and you're still um, being introduced to a lot of it. And we're just going to add on, you know, every week we're going to learn more on top of what we learn. So um, what may feel strange now is going to become second nature over the next 14 to 15 weeks. Um, and I feel like I missed someone. Mona. Oh, me. I'm good. (laughs) Okay. I'm okay. I feel better now. Awesome. So again, I will extend to y'all and I did record this so you can absolutely go back and um, let me just hit stop for this two hours. Um, You can absolutely go back.